convict and perfection of God is creator. And that will, should be a very interesting class. We also have a thank you note here from uh, the Richardson family and the uh, Emmett Carrot family. I hope I pronounced that right. And it'll be in the back. And we also have a thank you uh, card from uh, Marla Graves. And it will also be posted in the back. Now, let us, before uh, Brother Clayton has a special prayer for those that are on our sick list, let us go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we can come here and worship you in truth and in spirit, having no fear of anybody trying to stop us from showing our love towards you. We ask thee now to be with this congregation as we sing praises unto your name and that Rick will bring us a very good lesson and it will help us to live our lives more in your will. We ask thee also to forgive us of our sins and watch over us in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, one, one more announcement I've dropped. Steve Hensley, Daniel's dad, has had a heart attack and is not doing well. Please keep him in our prayers. Brother Clayton. If you picked up a bulletin, you'll see a list of those who are, are in all constant need of our prayers, those who are sick, those who are recovering from surgery, those who are not doing well. And those who are in, in uh, care-bound facilities, uh, I'm going to let you look at that list and see all the things that are about. Because if we sit here and talk about each, uh, problems about each one of these, we'll be here for another 30 minutes. So let's just look at these names. And then as you're praying about them, think about what struggles they're going through. And our life is full of struggles, isn't it? But you know what? There's on the first seal, there's a white horse with Jesus riding on it, and those following after him are wearing white as well. And if you're a member of his church, you're in good hands, right? Okay, so here we go. Let's look at this list. Here it's in your bulletin. Andrew Barnwell, Jenny Billings, I hurt for her, Bud Boone, uh, Bud Bird, June Boone. Debbie Carr, Linda Chapman, Marvin Clark, Kaylin Cordova, William Dill, Tom Ellingsworth, and leaving us. Terry Gamble, Randy George, Marla Graves, and she's here with us today, and that's good to see you, Marla. Marla. Laura Hamilton. She's a friend of the Fishers, but a good friend of us as well, so remember her as, as you pray. Dennis Hawkinson. Rick said he had a, a conversation with the daughter today, and he's doing much better, and that's good totally off of the machine and actually keeping stuff down. And that's good. So they're encouraged about that. You know, folks, that right there is quite a quite an achievement because he was in bad, bad, bad condition not that long ago. And here he seems to be improving. Who says prayers don't work, right? Okay. Um, Karen Helms, Connie Isis, Jordan Jusum, Samuel Kelly, Bobby Lewis. I'm glad to see him every time he's encouragement. John Nash, Patsy Payne, Frank Preston, Jacob Brock, Dean Schoenover, 
Todd Stuhlke, James Taylor, Liz Brown Taylor, Jared Trevino, Phoebe White, and those in home care, Judy Barrow, Ronnie Barton, Clay Blazer, Pat Lamb, Pansy Schulke, Otto Carey, Gina Tracy, and Eddie Watkins. That's quite a list, and the Lord knows every one of them. So if you would please, let's bow together. Thank you, Father. Thank you for hearing our prayers. And many times, Father, the words just aren't complete. We pray you'd hear our hearts. As we pray and as we as we beg on behalf of our, our friends and our brothers and our sisters in Christ. For those, Father, who are not doing well and where there's several who are very, very, very ill. And those who are improving and we're thankful for, you, for their success, we know that you're answering our prayers on their behalf. For those, Father, who are, who are needing special help, those who are in our care system, and we pray, Father, that you'd watch over each one and keep them safe, help them to improve. We pray that all that we say will be according to your will because your will will be done. But we're thankful, Father, that we can come together as your children and pray on behalf of others. We have some who are moving, have some who will be returning home today, some who will be traveling and some, Father, who are, who are away from us today, and we pray that you'd watch over each one. Strengthen us today, and may we always put you first. May the things that we do always bring glory and honor to you. We pray that you'll be with those who are, who are not able to be with us because of their health, and we pray, Father, that you continue to watch over them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First song this morning, number 166. I guess you notice you have song books this morning and you want to use them. 166, the entire song. All day long, in your song book. After you sing this song, we'll have the Lord's Supper. They bound the of Jesus in the garden of the They led him to the streets of the Savior so here and they said
We come to that time in our service where we we pause to remember the sacrifice of our Savior. We think about the love that he had for us that sent him to Calvary. There where he willingly laid down his life knowing that he would take it again. And in scripture, we have the record of the institution of that memorial feast or the Lord's Supper. And we see that it was practiced on the first day of each week. So as we come to that time, let's put away the cares of this day, what you're going to have for lunch, what you're going to do, or what you're going to watch on television this afternoon and think about what it is that God wants us to remember at this very time because without that sacrifice 
not a one of us would have hope. Jesus paid it all for me and for you. Let's pray. Our Father, we're thankful that you saw fit to record for us the institution of the Lord's Supper. And Father, that in that, you also taught us how we ought to take that supper. And we pray at this time, Father, you'll help us that our minds might be drawn back to Calvary. And there through our spirit eye, we might view those things that took place. And realize, Father, that he did that for me. He did that for us. In order that we might have something to look forward to far beyond. Anything this world or this life has to offer. Father, we understand that this sacrifice was made for your children and that these emblems, the bread and fruit of the vine, represents the body and the blood that was freely given that day for us. And Father, as we take this bread, which to us represents that body, We'd ask, Father, that you help us to take this in a way that would be acceptable and pleasing before you. Father, we ask this through Jesus. Amen. In so much as we take of the bread, Christ also picked up a cup with the fruit of the vine. And he said, drink this. It is my blood that will be shed for you. Would you pray with me, please? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for this day. We want to thank you for the the joy and the blessings that you've let us have. And we take this cup knowing full well its repercussions and what it means to be a child of yours. We ask you, Lord, to please don't let us take it in vain, but with the reverence and understanding that comes from being that child. This we pray in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're also at this time commanded to uh, give back to the work of Christ and to help this church further.
ministries and just so many other things we need that for. And we are we are told to do that in a pleasing manner. So we hope everybody's hearts in the right place. Would you bow with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we come this time in our worship to uh, give back to your work and the church and keep it alive and thriving. Bringing, hopefully, you know, bringing new souls here. Uh, it takes money sometimes to do that. So, and there, we hope that everybody will give in a pleasing manner and willingly in the right frame of mind. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Call number 801, 801, following this song we'll have a prayer. Once I stood in the night with my head down in the darkness.
Pray with me, please. Holy Lord, God Almighty, Father, we're so deeply thankful, dear Lord, that you give us an opportunity and the desire and the ability, Father, to be here today, Father, to extend worship to you. Father, we pray that our worship is in spirit and truth, and Father, that you will receive the honor and the glory. Father, that we'll be edified, and Father, that we will receive your word, and Father, that we will take your word and apply it to our lives, and Father, that we will share it with others to the best of our ability, Father, that you might give the increase. Father, we're so thankful for your precious son and his love and his sacrifice on that cruel cross. Father, that we might have the remission of our sins through the shedding of his blood and, Father, the hope of life eternal with you someday. Father, we beg forgiveness for our sins and our shortcomings, knowing, Father, that, that your blood, your son's blood continues to cleanse those sins that we repent and confess. Father, we'd ask you to give us the strength, wisdom, courage, and fortitude not to return those sins and father that we'd always be strive to be forgiving of others so that you'd forgive us father was mindful of a long list of prayer requests and father we were especially mindful of marla and father connie and father those many dennis and those many that are continuing to have ongoing health issues and father we Ask your richest blessings on not only them, but on the doctors and nurses and caregivers that's, that's looking after them. Father, those many that has physical needs, but Father, more importantly, if anything, is those that's spiritually lost. Father, pray that we strive to serve you by serving all those that's in need in whatever capacity, to, again, to the best of our ability. Father, as we continue this worship service to you, Father, pray that our hearts and minds are centered on you, Father. If we take in that engrafted word, Father, again, that we would, that we would, uh, if we have sin in our lives, that we would make preparations and change that. If we have somebody in the audience today that has never come to you and Father, and heard your word and believed that your son died for our sins and repented of those sins and confessed to you, Father, and put your son on in baptism. Father, pray that that would happen. And if there's others in this audience that may have turned away from you, Father, pray that something will be said today that they had turned back for it's eternally too late. Father, we, again, we ask all things in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. Phone number 250. If you're able, willing, would you stand and sing the entire song?
Invitation song number 916, 916. Jerry, thank you for leading that song. It's beautiful from where we were sitting to listen to it. It's just marvel. We do appreciate your attendance this morning, especially our membership who continues to support this congregation week after week. We give God the praise for that. We also give God praise that we have a Two men serving as our elders of the congregation, and they have been working, and I want you all to know that. And I'm proud of them, and we are blessed to have two men that have had years of experience in preaching the gospel and have the kind of Bible training that we can trust so that we know we have men that can lead us forward in the right directions of the Lord. And I appreciate their time. They spent a lot of time these last few weeks. I think Clayton, uh, particularly, and Paul thought they were going to retire, but they haven't been retired. If you'll notice, they're, they're putting the information in the bulletin each week. They're making visits. They're meeting together and working together and working with you to do what is necessary for us to grow and prosper because it's all about souls. Just like last week, our souls go was 125. That's souls of men and women and children. Well, we didn't quite reach our goal. But we rejoice because God received the glory. We were able to have people in this audience last Sunday, just like we do here today, visiting with us. And I know for a fact that some of those folks visiting were not members of the Lord's Church. And so they were able to hear the gospel. And they were able to be among God's people and, and to and experience and it is an experience to experience our unique worship that really is not unique in the sense of the scripture, but in the world religiously in which we live. And so they were able to sing a cappella with us. They were able to worship in simplicity and partake of the Lord's Supper if they chose to do so. And isn't it wonderful that people can experience that and then also hear about the gospel? Well, one of the things I want to mention in reference to our elders is that they have been concerned about making sure that we soon will have deacons working in the congregation. And so some of you might have been asking the question after the elders were appointed, what about the deacons? Well, I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 1 because we're going this morning to talk about deacons. In Philippians chapter 1, Paul starts out this letter, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. If you have the, another translation, you'll probably notice that the New York translations say overseers and deacons. Now what is interesting about this is that the word bishop is a transliteration rather than a translation. And so also is deacons. Now in the New American Standard, they translate overseers, but they chose to leave deacons, and there is a reason for that as we explore the meaning of that word. But when you ask the question, what about deacons? That may bring back some memories. How many of you remember growing up as a kid and having deacons in the congregation? How many of you remember sitting in church buildings without air conditioning? Yes. Deacons were responsible at one time for handing out fans. You remember the fans that used to work yourself manually? 
Yeah, they did things like that back then. They're also, they would work to keep people awake because when you get into a hot, humid building, aren't you thankful today we have this air conditioning? I know some of y'all might be a little cold, some of you might be a little hot, but it's a whole lot better than it is outside, especially yesterday mid-afternoon with the humidity. But their job was to keep folks awake. And in the years ago, they would have the sticks and in the early history of America that, that their function and job was to kind of poke people, to wake them up. And of course, you know, today, we don't have too much of this problem, do we? I always consider it's a preacher's job to keep folks awake, so I'll try to take that seriously. But that was one of the functions of deacons. Another one that I found very really interesting, and this here is a Church of Christ, and I want you to look at this building. Do you all see any windows? Now, this was before air conditioning. I think there's some on the side, but they didn't air condition the foyer. Maybe that was to keep the shade and the cold out more primarily than to let the air in. But, but I do remember the time sitting in Springfield, Western Lincoln, before air conditioning, that they had the windows all up. And, of course, you enjoyed that. But, but even before that, the deacons had the job of, taking care of the horses that were hitched outside the building. Now, Brother Clayton, Brother Paul, we don't have to worry about a deacon in charge of the horses, which is a good thing. Might be parking lot or vehicles, but not the horses. And there's a story that, that came out about deacons. And by the way, if you don't know it, there's a book full of jokes about deacons that preachers can tell. You want to go to Amazon or Google, you can buy that book. I don't have it. I thought about it now after I started doing some research for this sermon. That might be a good book to have. But historically, deacons have been kind of the subject of jokes between preachers and elders and elders and deacons and preachers and deacons and so forth. And the story's told that that the preacher was preaching, the horses were out front, it was one of those hot, humid days, and, and he's preaching his normal sermon, which, by the way, back then, did you remember, the sermons were not very long, right? No, they were very long. 45, 50, 60, 70, 80 minutes preachers were preaching. Well, this preacher, he was preaching on one of those hot, 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 humid days, and, of course, you can imagine the congregation was getting poked a lot, but the horses were outside, and this particular congregation didn't have the horses in the shade. But the preacher kept preaching. And then while he's preaching, the preacher noticed that through the door, one of those horses dropped down to the ground. So he realized, you know, maybe we need to attend to that horse. So he ended his sermon pretty quick, made his way back to the back after the invitation song, and he, he grabbed a couple of the deacons who were standing in the back they were acting as ushers and so forth, and he says, brethren, we need to get out there and attend to that horse. And so the deacons made their way outside, and sure enough, that horse was dead in the doornail, dropped over dead. Well, those deacons weren't going to let this lie dead. They decided they were going to come in and, and give the preacher the business. And, of course, they came in and said, Preacher, this is why you need to quit preaching such long sermons. And the preacher, you know, he's kind of like this. And, and they, then they went on. They kind of smiled and said, Man, and also, Preacher, you know your job is to take, take care of the dead, right? The preacher goes, Yes, yes, gentlemen, it is. But I tell you what, it's up to the deacons to dig the grave, get busy. Well, I'm thankful we don't have to worry about deacons taking care of horses. The word deacon is from an English word, uh, Old English, diakon, and that came from diakonus, which was from the ancient Koine Greek of the New Testament, diakonus. And so here, as you look at this evolution, you see it started here in ancient Greek, went up to Latin, and then into English which is why we read the word deacon. And what they did basically was transliterate, or in other words, make an English word out of the word deacon. And they leave it translated that way for a purpose. They wanted us to know it was a specific function and office within the church of our Lord. And so that's why we read about elders and, and deacons, overseers and deacons as a function in the church. And we are, as we will note later, given the qualifications for these men. But what's interesting is to know the, the meaning of the word. 
The word deacon in the original language of the Bible is a compound word made up of a word which means thoroughly, and the second one's dust. And it literally has the meaning of one who thoroughly raises up dust by moving in a hurry as a runner or a runner. And the idea is that it is the finding one who serves. And biblically, it refers to one who serves or ministers or urgently performs a dedicated function. But before the deacons of the church, it refers back to the runners who would run from battles to give messages to the authorities. And so they would thoroughly kick up dust as they hurriedly and urgently carried a very important message and played a very important function. And when you looked at that person, you understood that they were ones who executed the commands of another, especially of a master or a commander or a sergeant. And so they were the attendants, the ministers of those, and they were given specific functions, and their job was to be urgent, attentive, and trustworthy in carrying that message to another. Uh, this jar depicts uh, a couple of those messengers, and you notice their legs? Their legs are very muscular. It's because they took their job very seriously, and they wanted to be able to deliver those messages as fast as they could. Now, there's a fellow called uh, Philippides, or Phidippides, that you might recall. Phidippides was a runner. He was one of these deacons. That job, their job was to carry a message. And what became interesting about Phidippides is that he was given a job of running from Marathon to Athens to deliver news of the victory that occurred over the Persians at Marathon. Now there's a monument today that still stands of Phidippides. And what's interesting is that back in AD 120, actually it's probably written about 160, a man called Lucian wrote and said these words, the deacon brought the news of victory at Marathon to the people of Athens. He found the magistrate seated in suspense regarding the issue of battle. Joy, we win, he said. And then here's what's interesting and wrote a bit of history. He died upon his message, breathing his last word in the joy. You see, he became famous because he died. Most of y'all don't know, and I don't either, the name of the horse that died out in front of the preacher. This guy lived in, in history, not infamy. And it's quite interesting that that is the concept from where this word came from. Now, what is important to understand is when we look at the New Testament, we see that there is a great need for urgent services and servants in the church. If you turn to Acts chapter 6 and verse 1, in the very beginning of the history of the church, we read that in those days when the number of disciples were multiplying, and that's what we want to be about, isn't it? Multiplying. And so the number of disciples were multiplying, and that brought a need. And that needed to be a need that needed to be filled by servants. So the, there arose, unfortunately, a complaint. Against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. In other words, they had Greek Jews there, and those widows were being overlooked in the service of of providing for their needs. And that's what the church was doing. It was providing for the needs of widows, which we continue to have instructions for doing. And so there were folks that needed some care, but they were being neglected. They were being overlooked. And so there arose a complaint. Now, normally you think complaints are something that shouldn't even happen. Well, in this case, it was a valid complaint because of a need. In fact, as you look at this complaint, you notice, number one, it was a necessary complaint due to the needs of these widows. But here's what's important. There are some complaints that just don't need to be complained about, isn't there? But there are some complaints that are valid. But one of those that really isn't is 
a complaint that is a personal complaint. By what do we mean by that? Well, it was not a complaint. This particular complaint was not a complaint about what an individual didn't like about something expedient. It was about the need of others. It involved what was best for others. So something had to be done. We read in verse 2 of Acts chapter 6 that the twelve summoned a multitude of the disciples and said, it's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. It's interesting as you look at that word serve that it is a verb form of the noun deacon. It refers to one who serves or acts to serve, to minister. And so the disciples realized that they shouldn't leave the word of God and serve those tables. They needed special servants. You see the word used this way in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, there's that word servant. Let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified. And that is one of the great things about a deacon and someone who takes that work upon themselves as an urgent service to diligently minister. They're doing that which glorifies God. And so as the solution to this need, in Acts chapter 6, verse 3, therefore the brethren are told to seek out from among themselves, among you, he says, seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And notice that the apostles say, whom we may appoint over this business. And it was a business that needed attention. And then they said, but we will continually give ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And notice in verse 5, the same pleased the whole multitude. And they made choices. They chose seven men. Among those are Stephen, of course, and Philip. Men that were given the job of functioning as special servants to fill this need. So the scripture says then in verse 6, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. Now, this is a wonderful study within itself, and we'll not have time to do that this morning. But I do want you to notice that they set these men that they had chosen out of good reputation before the apostles. How do we do that today? Because we don't have the apostles. Nor do we have anyone that has the ability to lay hands on them to pass on the miraculous gifts of the Spirit, for example. And laying on of hands was... In the Old Testament and New Testament, biblical times was a one, a symbolic ceremonial action of approval. Second was, as we look at the New Testament, to pass on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So whatever happened here was significant in that primarily these men were set before the apostles and then they prayed. How do we do that today? Well, where do we find the word of the apostles? How do we put men before the apostles? We open the book. And thankfully, the book gives us the qualifications that these apostles knew about and wrote about. And so we can read about the qualifications of these men and what they are to be that are to be special servants working to glorify God. And so verse 7, here's what happened when they did the appointment. These special servants played a very important role because we read in verse 7, the word of God spread and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. So what happened? When these men took upon themselves the job of being an urgent servant to take care of the needs that were before the congregation, this freed up the apostles to do what? preach, and also freed up others to preach, I am sure. That is why, when we consider what Paul wrote to the church of Philippians, of Philippi, when he mentioned the overseers, the bishops, it's also important to recognize that he mentions deacons, because the church needs men to become these special servants, men qualified to take a special role and function within the body of Christ. And so we have the qualifications laid out for us in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 8. They're rather simple. 
but they are important. Likewise, deacons must be reverent. This is the idea that they are men of serious mind. They are men who will take their job seriously. When a runner was appointed to run with a message to give word of a battle, that runner went with a knowledge that he was doing a very, very important function. And these are men who understand their need to glorify God. And they're not double-tongued. You can trust their words. As the old Indian said, they're not speaking with forked tongue. They're men who are upright, true, and honest. And notice also, he says, not given too much wine. Now, you'll notice in this passage of Scripture, it does not read, not given to too much wine. The idea of understanding this is to realize that in the New Testament, the word oikos, which is from which we get our word translated wine, doesn't distinguish within itself of the juice or a fermented juice. You have to determine that. Well, when you look at this, too much wine, he's talking about someone who spends too much time drinking that juice that is fermented naturally, and you have to spend a lot of time with that in order to get drunk. And this is a person who is not a drunkard. There's people who are disciplined and living upright in the right direction to give God the glory, not given too much wine, not greedy for money. That is not a place to be. If that runner that ran with the message of victory to battle in the time of, of, of Athens and Rome, if that's all he did was get it for the money or did it, performed his function for money, that was a miserable person. And is he going to be the urgent worker that he should be? Well, the question is easily answered. Of course not. What else is the qualification for these men? Verse 9, holding the mystery of faith with a pure conscience. Paul would write to Timothy in verse 5 of chapter 1, says, Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. That's what separates the man who glorifies God, the man who takes upon himself to serve, and to serve with a sense of urgency and dedication. And that's who these men are, men who choose to be dedicated with a pure conscience. And they're going to devalue the, the great faith that's been delivered to us and exists within us because they respect the commandments of the Lord. And it's also interesting in verse 10 that, that Paul says, but let these also first be tested. And that word is a word that just simply means what the translation says. They're tested by examination. They're checked. They're passed upon with approval. And so they are tested. These are men who prove themselves. And then he says, let them serve as deacons. When men are chosen, they are men who have shown by their lives that they are seriously determined to serve the Lord. And so it's interesting as you look at that word uh, that's used there, it's translated actually as five words, let them serve as deacons, is a very long compound word that expresses the idea of the concept that they are going to be serving as servants, chosen, because they have been examined, they've been checked, they've passed approval. And then it goes on in verse 11, and he says, likewise their wives must be reverent, not slanders, temperate, faithful in all things. And so wives come into play for these men who serve, because as we know, wives are very important to the work both of elders and to the work of deacons. Also notice that even though some today says, well, we can have women as deacons. When you look at here, do we read qualifications for women to be deacons? What does he say? Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanders, temperate, faithful in all things. And let the deacons, if there's any question about what verse 11 says, look at verse 12. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife. That's very specific, isn't it? Ruling their children in their own house as well. So clearly identifies gender and as well as their function. And then verse 13, for those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves 
a good standing, a great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Why would anybody want to be a deacon? Why would any man want to be a deacon? Because it's a great work. It's a work of service, requiring men who are willing to step up and glorify God. And God will get the glory, both in the service of the deacon and in the work that that deacon does and the example he sets. No wonder in Acts, when this need arose, they looked out and looked for men that they could appoint over this business. If you think about a businessman, think about a deacon. He's one who is serious about his de deaconship, as you can call it that, even though it's not a biblical term. He's serious about his service. And that's why Paul could write, for those who have served well as deacons, obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. That's why Paul could write these words in, in 2 Timothy 1, verse 12, talking about the confidence and assurance that we have in Christ as faithful servants. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, Paul says, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded. And look at this. What is Paul persuaded of? That he is able to do what? That God is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. There's the context. Paul's trust was in the Almighty God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And he could have confidence. He says, I know whom I have believed. Deacons are men who can stand there as the Apostle Paul and say, I know. I have no doubt in whom I believe. And thus, with that faith, they're willing to step up and say, I'll serve. And folks, the church needs these kind of men. The church needs qualified servants to serve as deacons. And although the world may laugh at deacons and there's jokes you can read about deacons, truly, a deacon is no joke. He is a man who sets an example, who is proved by his service that he can serve and is willing to serve. Notice what Jesus said in John 12 as we end this lesson this morning. If anyone serves me, this is talking to anyone. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. That has to be first. Jesus is the one who paved the way. He's the pioneer of our salvation, the author of our salvation. He is the one that laid down the footsteps for us to follow him. He gave us the word that tells us how to do it. And so that deacon is one who says, I will follow because of the great faith that he has that Jesus is the Son of God. And notice what Jesus goes on and saying, where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my Father will honor. That's the honor we want, isn't it? This morning, are you on your way to the great honor? Deacons who serve the Lord faithfully along with every Christian who serves God in their capacity faithfully looks forward to the great honor. When God is going to bless us with the victor's crown, and that is possible because we first obeyed the gospel and then we choose to live faithfully. And that's what a deacon is. He's a man who's choosing to serve as a faithful obedient servant of Christ, looking forward to what God has promised, the crown of life. Is that what you are looking for? Can you say if you were to die tonight, I would have that crown? If not, maybe it's time for an examination. Maybe it's time for a look in the mirror. And if there's anything we can do this morning, we want to help you. If there's a challenge in your life to be faithful, then let us pray for you. And if, if you're here this morning and not a Christian, we found out this baptistry works, Bobby, just fine. And you can be baptized this morning if you need to do so. If you're willing to make that change in your life that you know you need to make, why not choose to make it this morning? Will the crown be yours? Think about it. So we stand and sing, would you come?
uh, Jake, Tracy came forward to remind me of something I forgot, and I apologize, Jeannie, I forgot to get it in the announcements, but her mother this week fell um, and ended up pretty um, serious position and was in the hospital. How many days, Gina? Yeah, they were, kept her for one day, but she fell and, and fortunately didn't end up breaking the bone, but bruised up pretty good and, and had several stitches, correct? Uh-huh. Okay, she, she fell, got twisted up in the auction, fell backwards and, and uh, cracked her skull, essentially, and ended up with stitches. So we want to remember her. And also bruised her face and cut her face. So let's remember Jeannie's mom and, and her name again. So I get Geneva Tracy. So let's remember her. Who's leading our closing prayer? Okay, Dan, would you specifically mention Geneva? And uh, I know that'll be appreciated. Jerry? Seven hundred and thirty four. I've had numerous requests for this. I've mostly declined, but we're gonna try it today. So please be standing, we'll sing this for now. I wanna do it a little different. I wanna sing it slower than usual. And the last note before we start the course, I want to put just a brief hold there, and then the alphos can come in and do your part, okay? You probably know it better than I do. I will meet you in the morning by the bride.
Pray with me, please. Our loving Father in heaven, we truly thank you for this day that you've blessed us with. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to come here, study your words, sing songs of praise to you. Father, we thank you for each and every one that is here with us today, watching on live stream. Father, we thank you for the lesson that Brother Rick brought to us. Father, we thank you for the word that you have provided to us so that we might know more about you, Father, that we may know about your son, Father, that we can rejoice with the word, knowing that we have a hope that being with you one day in heaven. And Father, we know that without Jesus, there would be no hope. And Father, we are truly thankful for the love and sacrifice that you and your son have for us and made for us on Calvary. And Father, we pray above all that we would be forgiven of those sins in our lives, that we would be forgiving of others, and that we would spend eternity in heaven with you and your son. And Father, we know there are many that are outside of Christ, and Father, we pray that we would do our part and that something would be done, that we could spread and water, and that you would give the increase, Father, that all of our family and friends and those who are spiritually lost, that they would be with us for eternity. Father, we have so many that we pray for physically as well, so many on our prayer list. Father, as Brother Clayton mentioned this morning, went through those names and things that they are facing. Father, we, we truly pray for them and the doctors and nurses and ministering to them. We pray for their families as they suffer right alongside with them. Father, we do pray for Janina Tracy, Gina's mother who fell. Father, pray that you would bless her and Father, that she could recover and feel better. Father, pray that you would help Gina as well. As you know, that has to be tough on her. Father, pray for that family. Father, we continue to pray for Marla and so many. I'm so thankful she's here today. And Connie. And Father, we continue to pray for John Nash as well. I know as many others that are on our prayer list. And Father, just need prayers. And Father, we know that there is power in prayer. And Father, pray that we all would take that opportunity to mention those and, and those others that may not be on our prayer list, though, that we know there are so many that are in need. Father, we do have prayers for those brave men and women who this very hour are protecting our freedom and ability to worship here and gather without fear and persecution. We thank you for the brave men and women of our military. We pray for them and their safety and protection as they do the same for us. We pray for those in law enforcement, firefighters, and all the medical personnel who all those who take care of us in time of need. Father, we are thankful for each and every one of those who step up and serve and, and help others. Father, we pray that you'd be with us as we depart, that we would come back at the next appointed time. Father, help us to take what we've learned. Father, help us to share with others. Help us, Father, to be a beacon of light in this world that at times can be so dark. Father, we pray for this world and we pray for our nation. Father, we pray for each and every one of us. Father, we once again thank you most of all for your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus, who gives us that hope of life eternal. It's in his precious name that we pray. Amen. I've tried to leave. I, I usually...